Hi. Very excited to be here. Now, um, instead of thinking of a fantastic opening to bowl you guys over right at the outset, I have a bit of a problem. Is it lavale? Is it lovely? Is there a le or a le? There is, I promise you, no consensus ever since I've stepped on this campus. So as you can see, I'm dealing uh, with this uh, intense uh, curiosity of cracking this pronunciation mystery before I hopefully leave your campus this evening. But before that, uh, let's step back and understand what got me to this problem at the threshold of curiosity. Albert Einstein said that I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. Am I trying to hint that I'm as intelligent as him? Mm -mm. Am I then trying to convince you that I'm absolutely devoid of any talents whatsoever? I hope not. But where this curly-haired genius and my impossibly straight strands meet is at the crossroads of intense curiosity. You see, ever since I was a child, I knew my brain was working differently. It was wired differently. My sisters would take me to the public pool to swim. And I should naturally have been thinking about survival because I really didn't know how to swim. But I would think about the curious and incredible properties of water. Closer to home, I would wonder about my large family. We were a clan, a tribe, I promise you, four sisters, where most of my friends had one sibling. So you see, I was that one girl in biology class who was paying even more attention than any of the boys when the human reproductive system was being discussed. <laughs> But um, honestly speaking, one could argue that by merely pursuing an education and uh, assuaging my curiosity by pursuing the sciences, you know, I would have been happy enough. But somewhere deep down, I knew that my mental expeditions went way beyond courses and curriculum. Now, I know I'm making some, myself sound like some Indiana Jones out here, but honestly, what it did was, uh, in a, it what might outwardly seem a willy-nilly way, my curiosities got me to stand and come to a point where I was absolutely meant to be. On a side note, I still don't know how to swim, so curiosities will only get you so far. You have to be willing to put in the effort. Now, I know that many of you have that one annoying person in your life, or a few at least, the ones who have absolute clarity and know exactly what to, they want to do with their lives from the time that they're in diapers, mind you. I, in stark contrast, am no such you know, poster child for that kind of drive and clarity. But what it did for me was, uh, uh, you know, what held me in good stead was the fact that I was constantly questioning and constantly learning. Now, my father was in the civil services. My earliest memory as a child is sitting in the back of this white ambassador, shaking, constantly shaking. And I had horrible motion sickness, so this wasn't pleasant. I was just moving from state to state. So while it irked me at that point in time, what a lot of this change and movement did was it helped me, I guess under coercion, but it helped me observe, listen, and cogitate. And these are very important skills. And while I was out having my own adventures, books came to my rescue as well. H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Charles Dickens, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, the Panchatantra, the Amar Chitra Kathai, all of them had me convinced that there was so much more to see, to do, to learn, and to experience. So you see, I was a bit of a nomad. And what that does in your foundational years is it liberates you from the shackles of expectations that we are also weighed down by. Because when you are open to discover and open yourself to the world and truly be willing to be surprised, that is when life truly becomes exciting. Um, now, I, as far as career was concerned, I didn't go about trying to explore every possible potential and opportunity like some uh, you know, career-oriented version of Zindagi Na Milegi Dobara. <laughs> but as it turns out, professionally, I was a bit of a curious nomad as well. A commerce graduate who moved to journalism, uh, I made a pit stop at doing my MBA as well, uh, only to jump into the big bad world of advertising. Now, I've been in your shoes. On day zero, I remember calling up my dad very proudly. I said, Papa, I've been placed in an ad agency. And my poor staid and very traditional father, I'm sure he scratched his head. I couldn't see it because it was an audio call at the time. He said, really? If you wanted to make soap and shampoo ads, why did you waste my money on an MBA? So while I didn't have any immediate responses at that point in time, it turns out I wasn't done torturing the poor man. Because after an almost decade-long stint in advertising, 
where I incidentally did end up selling a lot of soaps and shampoos amongst other FMCG products. I think I sold underwear as well. Yes, I did. Uh, I decided to write books. Well, let me rephrase that. Life and circumstances decided that I must write a book. And I was merely curious enough to try. Now, here's the flip side to curiosity. When people are curious about the unconventional choices you make, that doesn't necessarily fit into their scheme of things or their understanding of the world. I got up one day and said, well, let me try my hand at thrillers. Here came the, I mean, the feedback from people. Um, women can't write compelling thrillers. You know, why don't you try, try, try writing chick lit? Really? If there's one section of the world population that has murder on their minds daily, it has to be women. Right? So thank you very much. We're very well equipped. <laughs> so, and uh, you know, to carry on with this trajectory of unpredictability, I decided to write um, about a desi detective, right? Not a city slicker, one wearing a top hat or you know, smoking cigars and you know, wearing these trench coats, but a desi detective, right? Who has oily hair and wears butter chappals. Here came the feedback again. Who would be interested in reading about a you know a desi detective, really? So I can best describe my state of mind at the time by quoting. Uh, Priyanka Chopra Jonas, who very eloquently quipped quite recently, what was it she said? Hater is going to hate, potato is going to potate, roti is going to rotate, you do you. And guess what? I did me. I wrote exactly what I wanted to, to whoever I wanted to. And not only um, am I happy to tell you that most of them have done exceedingly well, they're all headed for screen adaptations. <laughs> Speaking of thrillers, let's uh, turn the lens of curiosity to this genre. Why do you think people are so fascinated by it, right? Crime, thrillers, psychological crime. Why is that? The primary emotions this genre is meant to elicit is anxiety, dread, fear, a sense of unease. It is meant to draw you in, trick you, deceive you, confuse you, and then deliver a thrilling ending. Now, it comes from, again, these are not traditionally pleasant emotions, are they? I don't think they are. But it comes from the curiosity of readers who want to vicariously live through the lives of, say, a serial killer, a felon, a stalker, those despicable yet strangely mysterious people we don't get to be on a daily basis. And thank God for that. Um, so essentially, now you can understand my task. I need to be the very people these hideous people that I'm speaking about. Uh, how do I do this? Let's take an example of Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, he's written a classic called Crime and Punishment, which is one of the earliest works of fiction in the criminal psychology space. And now he very, um, you know, a very, in a very detailed manner, he takes you through the mental machinations of a regular Joe, you know, who's going about his day, and he turns into a criminal driven by his misfortunes. Now, in another example, you might marvel at Hannibal Lecter. I'm sure you've heard of him. He eats people. Um, and, uh, or you might brand him a lunatic. But the intimacy and the authenticity with which the author delivers his mind and his world to you is key in eliciting contrasting emotions. On one hand, empathy. Because now, because of the author, you know where he's coming from and aversion. Because you can't quite stomach what he's doing. And these are, in a very intentional way, the contrasting emotions that will keep you hooked right till the very end. So you see, whether driven by accident, circumstances, or misfortune, the author might constantly deal with the psychology of the crime and the criminal. And I genuinely feel it's a very myopic and reductionist uh, you know, way to look at this genre, that Are, somebody dies. No, it's not. It's not just about a murder. It's about uh, there are so many layers and nuances and it, that, and so many things we need to do to make it a compelling and evocative read for you. Now, uh, the first question I obviously get is, uh, how do you do it? How do you go about doing a bench press, making roast chicken, learning Kathak with your daughter, all while thinking about murder and mayhem? Well, I can't say it comes naturally to me. Uh, you know, a lot of authors tend to say that what I write is a reflection of my inner self. Well, people who write crime should stop saying that because we'd all land up in Tihar jail. Um, so you see, it all starts uh, with, again, the answer lies, again, in curiosity. It is the curiosity about how the human mind works. What would possibly turn you, you, or me into a criminal? 
What is the kind of crime that will make your toes curl up with dread? And that is what the author needs to figure out. Now, uh, it all starts with an idea. Where do we get these ideas? They don't hang in trees. We can't go plug them. Uh, so um, basically, Arthur Conan Doyle said that, uh, sorry, Ernest Hemingway said that um, it's very easy to write. All you need to do is sit at a typewriter and bleed. Graphic, isn't it? But it's very true. Because uh, when I say that coming up with the idea is the easiest part of the process, I only mean that in a relative sense. Now, what do you do for these ideas? Be a sponge. Be curious. It's about soaking up all the conversations, everything that's happening in your environment. Please don't tell other people this, but my favorite hunting ground is coffee shops. Yeah, I mean, I get my best ideas there just by listening in on people. And there's so much around us, right? Whatever's happening in our environment, newspapers, there's uh, you know, the idiosyncrasies of people, the comedy of life unfolding around us, there's constant stimulus. And think about it, the 500, look at the content we consume, the 500 shows you watch online, don't lie, I know all of you watch those many shows, and while you consume it as entertainment, consciously or subconsciously, a writer's mind is sifting through all this information, trying to you know, figure out what is that one sticky idea that needs to develop uh, further into a fantastic, compelling story. Another amusing question I get is, hey, how do you decide who lives and who dies? Well, I'm not God, nor am I Ted Bundy or Dexter, or for that matter, Cyanide Mohan. Have you heard of Cyanide Mohan? He's one of the most notorious serial killers to come out of India. They chose their victims. I am a slave of my story. And how do I do this? This crazy, arduous, exacting process all starts from what we call in screenplay parlance as a logline. A logline is a succinct and effective summation of your entire story into one line. Then, of course, I, there's a massive plot which needs to be broken down into cohesive sections. And then after that, there are multiple drafts. And imagine, after all that work, there are so many times when I have changed everything from the sequence of events to, well, who lives and dies. Now, uh, it is all about context, the crime, the criminal, the circumstances, the characters, it all needs to fall you know, into a perfect rhythm, like a perfect melody. Now, I'm gesticulating like a musical conductor and not an author, but I just want to highlight the amount of work and the very delicate and tedious balance that needs to be cracked to get all these elements right. Now, let's come to the fun part, right? The tricks of the trade. Shh, don't tell any of my fellow authors I told you this, otherwise they'll come at me with a knife and I don't want that. Um, some of these you will easily be able to identify with the quantum of, of you know, content we consume. Uh, cliffhangers, high stakes, red headings. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Now something else that is absolutely critical to this genre is the power of suggestion, which works in tandem with your mind. My job is not to complete scenarios for you. Walk with me to a, say, escape room, right? There's a dim lighting, there's cobwebs, there's a tinny sound in your ear. There's a sense of unease that's you know, building up inside of you. There's muffled screams, right? I will not tell you what's happening or what's about to happen or what the character is thinking, which in our parlance is called the third person omniscient, where you know pretty much everything. My job is to bring you and make you stand next to this character and feel as uneasy and terrorized and terrified as him or her, and let every sequence, every step unfold as is, feeling everything as and when they're feeling it. And that is what actually creates the dread. The dread. So whether that there's somebody in the cor you know, corner just jumping out at you who's going to slit your throat, or is that a cobweb or just a shadow, you're going to discover it all in real time with the character. So you see, thrills are at their thrilling best when left on the precipice of suggestion, discovery, and dread. Because here's the fantastic part of the human mind and human psychology. Your mind is doing half the work for us. So when we're talking about the mind working for us, there's something else that we employ called atmospherics, which is self-explanatory, but let me give you an example. Why do you think most of these stories unfold in dilapidated mansions, old creaky houses nobody stayed in for years, these dense woods you can never navigate through, or uh, you know, foggy hill stations? That is, again, another trick that we employ to make a conducive setting for the story to unfold. Right? Your mind is working in tandem with the environment that we are creating and the structure for the story that we are creating. Of course, a small bit on the characters, I think they need to play an even more important role because there's so much of exciting stuff happening around them, right? How do you make them memorable? 
give them monikers. Uh, sometimes it's about you know behavioral traits, characteristic quirks. I have characters in my books called uh, Mutton, Bhindi, Prachand, uh, you know, Tali Masi. Is this gimmicky? Is this formulaic? It works for my genre. And what it merely does is it creates a certain heft and stickiness in the mind of somebody who's reading. So they don't forget your characters, you know, embroiled in this entire story. So that is another way of, that's another trick. Now beyond all the tricks and the tropes, there is an X factor, which is born at the intuition of gut, courage, and intuition, right? It's, it's, it's what you feel deep inside. It's employed by people like Kiego Higashimo, who have written who have written thrillers and turned the concept on its heads by writing a different kind of thriller, like a, a gentle thriller. It's employed by people like Margaret Atwood. Please tell me you've not just watched Handmaid's Tale, but read it as well, because it's a fantastic book. She has written speculative fiction like thrillers. It's employed by people like Dorothy Sayers, Anne Cleves, Agatha Christie, Sujata Massey, who have brought women to the playing ground of criminals and detectives, which was a place nicely reserved for men like so much else. So you see, um, the uniqueness of an author's voice will come at the intersection of that gut and obviously their own body of experiences. And this usually comes from a very quiet place within that doesn't necessarily uh, subscribe to the most popular ideas or the best writing advice. Now I must very responsibly admit that while curiosity can only expand your horizons much like it did for me, it can also make you lose your breakfast. Um, I was once researching this particularly graphic scene, how to decapitate the human body without spilling blood. Yeah, not the best breakfast research, but I had to do it. And there were some matching images as well. My poor dad was just sitting next to me, quietly after his puja, sitting and eating his poha, and oops, curiosity got the better of him. And he just peeped and wanted to check what his darling daughter was doing. He lost his breakfast, yeah. So other than that one unfortunate incident, um, He's very proud of what I have accomplished. And he's finally made his peace with all the meandering that I've done in my life. And he has promised to watch all the shows that come from my books, provided that I write a little more about the living as much as I write about the dead. <laughs> Thank you very much.